Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Brian Levin. Uh, I'm a product designer. I'm a developer. Uh, I used to work at Facebook. Before that, I was at Buffer. Uh, today, I'm working on a new company with a couple friends. Uh, it's called Spectrum. And I've been building products for a long time, and most recently, making the transition from to de design into development has really opened my eyes and, and become a fascination with the differences in the processes that designers and developers take when building products. Uh, when we started Spectrum around eight months ago, we made the decision to use GraphQL. And what struck me most about GraphQL was it was this tool that has a unique opportunity to be useful for both designers and developers, and I believe to bridge the gap between two disparate processes. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, is how you can think about GraphQL as an opportunity to design and build better products together as a team. Uh, but first, I want to explain uh, a concept called the gap, which in this context, I'm talking about the difference between two processes and the distance between them. On one side, we have product design, which would be your iconography, your visual design, uh, color picking, layout, all that kind of stuff. And on the other side, uh, I'll just bundle this into developing the dang thing. So we have these two processes that sit on opposite sides of the spectrum. And this gap in between, this void, is what I'm going to call the gap. That's the difference where uh, the processes just don't quite align, OK? So this is uh, the meetings that you have every week with your designers. This is the shared documents you have on Google. Uh, this is the notifications updating you on the specs or requesting new icons. Uh, and for me, it represents uh, a lot of lost opportunity to work on the things that we actually want to be working on, which is building products for people in the world. Now, this gap exists for a reason. Uh, I believe it's partially because of our tools. And ironically, I believe our tools are in a unique position to, to close the gap. Uh, so I'm going to share <laughs> some examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, so I come from the design world again. And I would be embarrassed to admit how many hours I've spent nudging pixels. Uh, but I've done it. And that's because the design tools that are in wide use today are imperative. Designers are literally drawing pixels, uh, nudging up and down, uh, picking colors, choosing type sizes, all this kind of stuff. And you're doing all of this in an unknown environment. So Sketch and Photoshop, they don't know if you're building an iOS app. They don't know if you're building a web app. They don't know if you're designing for teenagers in the United States or if you're building for uh, folks in offline rural India, right? Uh, that's a problem. And you add on top of this an imprecision. So Again, design tools, you're, you're nudging. You're manually picking sizes and alignments. And as, as a result, we're prone to making mistakes. The problem with design tools is that they don't care if you make mistakes. Uh, if you're misaligned or your color's wrong, your Sketch or Photoshop isn't going to throw up an error and say, hey, you're doing this wrong. Uh, you need to make, or this doesn't align with your underlying design system. So as a result, what we output from our design tools, like Sketch and Photoshop, is an illusion. What we're making is this static, made-up representation of an idea of a thing that someone will maybe someday use. Now, development tools, uh, I won't say they're perfect, because I know they're not. But in many ways, they have opposite properties to the design tools that designers are using today. Uh, they are declarative. Uh, they care about the environment that you're working in, whether you're building an iOS or an Android app. They're more precise. And when you make an error, it cares that you've made an error. And it stops and tells you what went wrong, where it went wrong, and how to fix it. And at the end of the day, what we've coded up is the real thing that your end user is going to touch and feel and interact with. And that matters. So here's just a quick example. Uh, on the top uh, is a design tool with the bane of every designer's existence, which is misaligned pixels, uh, compared to something below, like a GraphQL error, where I've typed something dumb. The system knows it's wrong, and it tells me where I went wrong and maybe suggests how to fix it. So our tools live in these different worlds. And, and when you live in different worlds, you start thinking in different ways. You start communicating in different ways. And we think about building products in different ways. Now, there's good news. Uh, the good news is that this gap is closing, I think. Uh, we're in a beautiful time where tooling is getting better. Uh, I think tools like Figma, like Framer, from the design world, things like Compositor Lab, Storybook, all these are coming together to, to really narrow that gap and make uh, communication and collaboration between designers and developers easier than ever. And 
That's where GraphQL comes in because I think this is the next kind of tool that we can think about as a stepping stone between these two disparate processes uh, that really helps us to communicate as designers and developers. There's a few reasons. The first is that GraphQL is expressive, right? It's not so much about the data itself as it is about the relationships between data. I can understand the way things interact with one another, how they nest, uh, and, and uh, uh, it's an abstraction, right? So GraphQL doesn't care about your underlying data storage model, doesn't necessarily care about the bits and bytes. Uh, it can be this beautiful abstraction that lets us talk and think about the data that our application is going to use in more natural terms. And as a result, I believe GraphQL is a more human experience when it comes to building products. Uh, we, we talk about our data in, in ways that feel natural. We can read them and write them in much more natural and expressive ways. Uh, here's just an example which you all will recognize. Uh, to a non-technical person, technical person doesn't matter. You can look at this and grok the basic idea of what's happening, right? We're looking for a user, some information about that user, and some information about their friends. And this, the simplicity of being able to read and write something like this changes the way that we think about building products. It changes the way we talk to one another. And so I'm nearing the end of my time. And so my message to you is to realize that GraphQL is not existing for its own sake. It's existing in the service of building great products together. And GraphQL is more than just a development tool. It can be a design tool. Uh, so I would encourage you all to consider introducing your designers to GraphQL. When I first saw Graphical for the first time at Facebook, it blew my mind to be able to so easily and uh, quickly understand the way data is constructed and relates to one another at Facebook. And exposing designers to those ideas is not only going to make your communication better, collaboration easier, hopefully save you all some time in meetings, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, that's, what we're all here to, that's what we're all here to do, which is make better products together. Uh, thank you.